Hello everyone and welcome to this YouTube stream. Uh, yes, it is a live stream, but I thought I'd make it short and sweet and instructive for everyone to be able to learn. So today we are going to tackle some opening tricks that I swear by. I've used it at international tournaments, World Youth. I've used it at the World Olympiad. It has worked very, very well. I think I have some of the games committed to memory, but most importantly today we are going to be addressing the basic lines. I'll be running through the most amazing opening, the Scotch Gambit, as well as the fried liver attack. I'll just dabble in that to like sprinkle the little sprinkles at the end. <laughs> but welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, I'm really excited to tackle this. This is something that um, I obviously have spoken about before and uh, can't wait to speak speak about again. I've been playing these openings for years. Uh, the lighting might change because the sun is still up, <laughs> but we are here together and uh, let's get started. Alrighty, so the first thing I'm going to show you and just to sell the opening to you is a game I played at the World Olympiad in 2016. I played um, for my Olympiad team and I was bored number three. I think I was also the first person in the entire hall of players to finish. The game ended in eight moves. Unbelievable, right? So from start to finish, it was theory and we won. So the Scotch Gambit is very similar to the Scotch game where you play d4. I'll show you here. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. So the Scotch Gambit is an opening for white, then you play d4, e takes d4, and the Scotch game would be knight takes d4, where you are not gambiting a pawn, a gambit is giving away material for quick development, space in the center and stuff like that, which you obviously have to take advantage of as quickly as possible. You're gaining tempi uh, in exchange for actual material. So the moment your opponent is able to equalize the position, they end up with a pawn up and uh, it's a little bit tricky to to play for an advantage from that point so we're not gonna look at the scotch game today we are here for those opening tricks that are super savvy to use in bullet games blitz games and just as a surprise weapon against your opponent even over the board i would suggest so this is definitely worth looking at hello everyone uh, thank you so much for joining us today <laughs> Um, and we have a chat message from Giant Pixels that says, this will be useful to stop you from destroying me with the scotch. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry um, for, for destroying you with the scotch. I also have my dog next to me for moral support, who I think just popped the wildest fumes into my direction, which is great. Love the perfume. <laughs> okay, so the scotch gambit is when they take... And you don't take back with the knight, but you play bishop to c4. And now the magic begins. Alrighty. So here my opponent um, responded with bishop e7. But there are a number of things that black can do in response to this bishop c4 move. They can try to hold on really tightly to the pawn. And a lot of players do that when they don't know the theory in the scotch gambit. They look at the position, they say, you just gave me a free pawn. I'm going to try and keep this free pawn, so they try and play bishop c5 to protect it. Or they play bishop b4 to try and trade this pawn, because c3 is the natural response to bishop b4 check. I'm going to remove the arrows to make things a little simpler. Um, and then sometimes they try to give the pawn back, but in exchange for the e4 pawn. So they play knight to f6. So not to overwhelm you with all these candidate moves, um, from the get-go, so we'll go one move at a time. First, by showing you things not to do with the black pieces. So my opponent played bishop to e7. And looking at the position, you've already given up a pawn. Do you take one back? You can. Or you can make things even spicier by playing this beautiful move, c3. Now, there are a ton of advantages to playing this move. As you can see, the evaluation bar hasn't shifted an inch. If anything, it's like a minute advantage for white. And black can capture again. You're like, 
But this is the second pawn. Why would I give up another one? And no, you don't capture back. There's something beautiful that white can play. So if you're watching this video back, you can pause the video and try to figure out the move. If you're watching this live, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a full five seconds to come up with the move. Yes, the move here is queen to d5. Queen to d5. Posing the question to this pawn on f7. If you take a look, yes, it's still the opening. It's move number six and it's almost impossible to protect this pawn. If you play knight f6, it's checkmate on f7. If you move the pawn, it's still checkmate. And if you play d6, well, that's exactly what my opponent did. But let's take a look at the different options here that black has available to them. Not a lot. Knight h6, the only move. And you may think, but the bishop can take and it's still going to be checkmate. Why isn't the evaluation bar shooting up? And there are a few tricky things to take note of here. You can take, and I definitely suggest taking, black can castle. Now it looks like you can just bring the bishop back to c1, and I'm not going to play it because you'll see the evaluation bar not like this move very much, and it will go in black's favor, just ever so slightly, right? Uh, but the reason why we don't bring it back, um, I mean, the reason why we would, I suppose, is to stop the pawn from capturing, and then you would capture back with the bishop and everything is dandy. But there is this very, very ugly move that black has, and it's knight to b4. And it's annoying as well, because you're thinking, well, the knight is moving twice in the opening, the only other piece that black has developed is the bishop. Why is it so good for black? And what you'd struggle to find is a move for white. Protecting the queen and protecting c2. You might think you can use the queen to defend the c2 square. But lo and behold, there is this... Oof! There's this move, c2 with the pawn. And it attacks the knight, it attacks the queen. And you're basically just giving the piece back. So instead, well, we can't exactly just move away because knight check and it picks up the rook and we don't want that. So in this position, I'll give you a few seconds to figure it out. The move is bishop takes g7. Bishop takes g7. And after the king captures on g7, now you can think about moving the queen. Maybe queen h5 is nice. Um... I think queen h5 is the move. What What is the move here? Maybe just knight takes c3. Let's not be too fancy because now if knight b4, uh, the pawn is no longer on c3 and you can just safely come back to d2 with the queen covering c2 and there aren't any tricks for black to play. But I still prefer white's position here just because white has developed one, two, three, four pieces and black has only developed two and has a very, very, very bad king. I mean, the breeze. Come on. There's no way that you won't be able to get some sort of attack against the king. But in situations like this, there are very important notes to make. One, white should avoid exchanges of minor and major pieces. Maybe you can give up some pawns on the king side to open up some files for the rook. I would even suggest long castling eventually for white, just because you get this chance to break through on the king side. You want to keep your pieces. You want to keep the pressure. You're ahead in development. Um, black's king is unsafe. And all black wants to do is exchange pieces to make things more simpler and more safe for the king. Because in the end game, the king belongs in the center. In the middle game, in the opening, king belongs safely tucked in the corner. That's why we have castling. Right. So let's go back a couple moves and I'll show you exactly what my opponent played. So in this position, my opponent didn't think very long and played this move and the evaluation bar is giving away the answer. It is in fact mate in two. And I'm sure you can spot it already. It's queen takes f7, king d7 and bishop to e6. And that is how I won a game at the World Olympiad in Baku. Azerbaijan in eight moves. Absolutely incredible, right?
crazy. Okay. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, this in particular is going to be our stable position that we come back to a lot in the Scotch Gambit. But let's go back a little bit more, right? So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. And this opportunity arises to play d4. Now, of course, after they take, it may seem just intuitive to take back because you're like, they took my pawn, I have to capture back. But we know we're going to play a gambit and we've committed fully to this gambit. So bishop to c4, one of my favorite openings in the entire world. Alrighty, so let's go through some basic responses for black. One being bishop to c5. And why this response is so common is because black tries to hold on to this d4 pawn. They say, I am up a pawn, I gave you some space to develop, but I am not going to let you capture this pawn back. Because the moment white gets the pawn back, white has a very strong center, they have a lot of space, and they're probably ahead in develop a development. Because what does black end up doing with this bishop? They play have to play d6, having no pawns in the center. White remains, um, you know, having this one e4 pawn. So once again, what does white do? White will continue to add the pressure, pose some questions to black and say, come at me, bro. Take the pawn. I dare you. So offers this trade on c3. And if they take, well, that is when all hell ra rains down. Honestly, I don't know the saying. I often say that my English is terrible, but English is like basically the only language I speak, so I can't say that. I do read, I promise. <laughs> okay, so there are a few things that black can do to respond. They can ignore it, but if they ignore it, you are basically going to just capture back, have two pawn center, the strongest thing in the entire world, everything white would ever want in this position, or they can push the pawn. This is one of the most annoying responses because you capture back and don't get a two pawn center. Um, they're basically giving the pawn back to you. You still get a lot of space in the center and prospects. For instance, if they play some like random move, you have this beautiful tactic. You can play bishop takes f7, king takes f7 and queen d5 check, forking the bishop and the king. But let's go back two moves. That's why I love this position or love this opening so much because of the tactical prospects. And if your opponent missteps ever so slightly, you take advantage and there's a very good chance that you win. And I know that at a club level, um, especially anyone rated below, I suppose, even 2000. I mean, I played a 21, almost 2200 at the World Youth Chess Championship. In the first round, I played the Scotch Gambit against her and she had to sacrifice her queen in order to survive and I won that game with the Scotch Gambit. So literally at any level, this is possible. Those people who don't know how to deal with it are in danger. It's like that kid sitting at the back of the bus in the Simpsons movie saying, I'm in danger. That is who they are. I mean, that's your opponent if they don't know how to respond to this. <laughs> okay, so now we can look at the spiciest response, which is captures. Because why I wanted to pause at this moment is that black is plus two, meaning they are up two pawns. White has captured nothing. But that's about to change. You can take a moment here and tell me what do you think white will play? Right, white is going to play, bishop takes f7. Now, I'm not saying it's completely winning, but the king's going to be in the center. So I definitely think that counts for something. King takes f7 and queen to d5, check. If there are any questions you have with the lines uh, presented, you can leave a comment below or you can just go to a website like chess.com or leechess where they have a built-in engine and check out these lines yourself. Play through it, have some fun, because, I mean, I'm sure some people will have this question. What happens if the king doesn't capture? And um, for me, it's like, just keep on capturing, or you can literally just take the pawn, because if they do ever capture your bishop, you have this check. 
but I'm just looking at, you know, main options here. After queen to d5, king to f8 is actually the best move. And I'll show you why. You may think, but why? You just take with check and then you can take the pawn. And the reason is, if they go king to e8, you have this intermezzo, this Zweigensuch, um, flexing my very extensive German vocabulary. <laughs> Queen to h5 check. And if they move the king, then it's simple. You just take the bishop. If they move the pawn, then you take the bishop. Now you might think, but they're going to capture another pawn. And now they're two pawns up. But you play bishop takes. And this bishop has a terrific diagonal down on this a1, h8 diagonal, aiming at the rook. And they are forced to put their knight into a pin. And uh, this knight is paralyzed because of this. And black cannot castle. Remember, this king has moved already. So black cannot castle. And so the coordination of black's pieces are going to be kind of tough to deal with. And I know that white has a lot of prospects after, for instance, castle, uh, d6, and maybe even queen c4. Because you definitely want to stop the bishop from developing to e6, but you also want to control as many squares and diagonals as possible. So that is that line. I also want to avoid going too deep into theory, um, just to avoid confusion and that sort of thing. I wanted to give you a nice summary and overview of the scotch gambit but okay back to our stable position and the last move we looked at was bishop to c5 another move that could be annoying to deal with is bishop to b4 check and to that i say just play c3 a lot of these lines are going to lead to a material imbalance so you have to get ready to lose a pawn or two in order to get a good attack Already we know that bishop c5 is really bad because our bishop takes f7 ideas. So bishop a5 has to be played. And now there are two moves you can play. Queen to b3 or castles. I like both of these moves. Um, both of them are developing. Uh, king castle usually means that you can attack sooner. So let's start with castling. And after bishop to b6, which is normal. But if they don't want to move the bishop a third time, so they've already moved it twice and then they'll have to move it again. Maybe they play d6, trying to get the bishop to g4 so that they can pin something. Now you play queen b3, attacking this pawn, queen to f6. And uh, I'm going to try and remember this move. Okay, I think it is. e5 is perfectly fine. But like I said, I'm going to avoid going too deep. I think just d takes e5, rook e1 or bishop g5 is fine here but what's nice is it gives us a lot of like paul morphy vibes where you are playing something um aggressive and uh, forcing your opponent to react on every single move they have to deal with the problem that you are creating and that's what i love you don't play quiet moves where your opponent has so many options you play something where you are forcing them to deal with or react to your move immediately Okay, so let's go back. And that is what happens if they play bishop to b4. And now one of the most common responses to bishop c4 being the scotch gambit is knight to f6. And this is very, very important. Um, I'm probably not going to go too much in depth into the e5 move because there are two uh, very common responses to knight f6. There's e5 being the more solid approach and castles being one that that I like the most. Alrighty, so let's begin with e5. Sorry. <clears throat> We're going to begin with e5 and uh, then the response is d5. You can ampersand the pawn. I promise you as many memes as you watch and as many streams as you check out, ampersand is not forced. Although I'm a huge advocate for, you know, capturing the pawn. In this case, it might just benefit black a little bit more. You can take the knight or bishop b5 is uh, the main move here. And after knight goes to e4, you play knight takes d4. And it's very balanced. It's very equal. 
black controls the center just as much as white does. Um, and for me, I like throwing the spanner in the works and balance positions are just are not my forte. So after knight f6, I play castles. Castles. And what black was really threatening was to take another pawn. And this is one of the main moves, actually. You can see that the evaluation bar says 0-0, zero, zero, even though black is up two pawns. And you must have guessed it already, rook to e1 is the main move, and d5. Now I rub my hands together, because there are two things you can do. You can keep it safe, or you can just allow the bloodbath to commence. And I'm sure, as some of you might be thinking, watching this, if you're going to try something as crazy as the Scotch Gambit, you might as well go all the way. All right. So the first move I'm going to show you is the safer option. And then we're going to look at the really, really exciting option, which is, yeah, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Okay. So the safe option is to play bishop takes d5. Now you may be thinking, you just gave up a pawn. Two pawns, in fact. And now you want to give up a bishop? And this is the safe option? What are you even talking about? And believe it or not, queen takes d5. And you must have seen it by now. Mm -hmm. You can pause if you haven't. Knight to c3. You get the piece back. With interest. The interest being that you captured a pawn on d5. Pawn cannot take the knight because the queen is hanging. The knight cannot take because there is an absolute pin on the king. Um, so yeah, we have a relative pin and an absolute pin in action at once. Um, talk about two birds, one stone. So the queen will have to retreat, probably queen d7 or queen d8. And then you capture back, rook takes e4. And this is more interest. You're just collecting all the interest on your fixed deposit here. Knight takes d4. And if knight takes d4, rook takes d4. And white gets a really, really nice position. But like I said, this is the safe option right but for me i like the spice this is why i like curry and a lot of spicy mexican food because this is the moment where i show you the move that is going to throw you off your chair so hold on tight everyone the move i'm about to show you is knight to c3 knight to c3 now you might may see the evaluation bar drop a little bit and that's because it is not the first engine move and it's a very dubious approach to a position like this if your opponent has no idea what's going on then it's very easy to make a mistake and i will run you through the thought process of a regular chess player and what they might be thinking they might be thinking okay here's an opportunity for me to capture a minor piece being a bishop or a knight. I can either take on c4 or I can take on c3. But which one is more valuable? Which one is going to lead to the best uh, possible outcome for me? And of course, the answer is the bishop. You want to take the bishop because bishops are much better in the end game. This is probably going to be an open position. Um, so bishops are always going to have more range and black will be left with the bishop pair. Or you could take the knight. Believe it or not, the best move is to take the knight. So those of you who want to play black against this, now you know all of our secrets. And I'll run you through uh, this move first and then this move. This was uh, the response of the Women International Master I played in 2014 at the World Youth. And um, I ended up winning that game. She was close to 2200 at the time. So even I am completely shocked uh, that that was the case. Very, very nice game. I think I remember most of it, though. It was 10 years ago. Wow, 10 years ago. I'm old. Okay, anyway. Existential crises behind us. <laughs> All right, so pawn takes knight being the best move. Because now uh, they're up a piece. And white's plan is to get this piece back. And once again, with interest or with some sort of advantage in exchange... So bishop takes d5. Of course, you're not going to take with the queen. You're going to take with the bishop. And so black's um, only concern here 
is trying to protect the knight and preserve this knight. So f5, which looks kind of crazy because the king's still in the center. Knight to g5. Now two things. Two things. Black can take this pawn or black can try to uh, defend the position, right? Defend, defend the knight. I have to try and remember quickly um, which was the best way to defend it. Think, think, think. There is a way for sure, but I know that this move um, can lead to something pretty crazy, right? So, yes, I, I should definitely have some notes with me, but I was trying to be fancy and just recollect everything, you know? Okay, but I remember now. So, C takes B2, and of course, if we take back with the bishop, this queen swings all the way to g5 and captures our free knight. Which is hard to see because you're like, you play knight g5 because you're attacking e4 and it's very easy to forget that this is the only piece defending your knight. So the move is in fact knight takes knight. But you may be thinking, now black's going to make a queen. Oh my goodness gracious, black is going to have a queen. And the evaluation bar giving it away once again, it is checkmate in one move. And white plays knight to f6 and it's checkmate. Believe it or not. Because it's check with the knight. It's check with the rook. And the knight is covering the square. The bishop's covering the square. The rook is covering the square. It is over for black. Checkmate. Can you believe it? So if you're playing with the white pieces, be careful not to take the pawn. Just because the queen is going to swing across and capture the knight. But this is a very, very fine way to end the game. Okay, but like I said, it's dubious. A lot of it means you might have to calculate or do some preparation on your own, but I'm not going to hold your hand and run you through all the details. You might have to do that on your own. Okay, now rubbing hands again together, we're going to find out what happens if black takes the bishop, which is also the most common response for people who are unfamiliar with positions like this. Okay, so we're going to capture the bishop and... Did the camera just move a little bit? I think Coda's moving my camera. Yes. Yes, he did. Let me just shift my camera back. Coda, you're in the way. <laughs> Coda is my dog. He's sitting at my feet. I just want to shift the camera a bit. Okay. I think that's a little bit better. Anyway. I tried to shimmy him a little bit, but there's there's no... Yeah, you gotta let sleeping dogs lie, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, so the spice continues. We take the knight with the rook, and it is check. And uh, one of the most common responses is not to play bishop e7, just because you can easily pile the pressure on this bishop, but rather to play bishop to e6. Now I'm going to use this moment to show you my game against um, the player who was close to 2200 and uh, we'll, we'll run through that and then go back a little bit and, and there'll be moments I'll say okay pause the video try to figure this out all right so knight takes naturally knight takes rook takes and queen c8 now it is white to move it's a very basic move to come up with so you can pause it briefly and think and the move is bishop to g5 because I want to win the queen with rook d8. It's not technically winning the queen, but um, it's a nice threat because at the end of the day, if you're piling the pressure and you're scaring your opponent into playing something much weaker or creating weaknesses for themselves, then that's a win in my books. f6. f6 was played by my opponent. And you can see the evaluation bar shot up a little bit. Use this moment now to come up with a good move. Yes. All right. Indeed, I played bishop takes. 
I know you're giving up another bishop and you're probably thinking, Jesse, you've already sacrificed 10 million pieces in this game. Why would you continue to do so? And I will tell you why. So pawn takes. And yes, queen to h5. Queen to h5. And uh, there are two moves that black can play. Black can play king to e7, which black definitely does not want to do. Or bishop to f7. Right. So bishop f7 is what she played. And white to move. Okay, I played rook to e1. The only piece that is not active in the position. I suppose the knight now is the least active, which we'll bring in later on. And after bishop e7, I'm going to stop one more time. Uh, you can pause the video while I check out chat. Yes, the move here is... Drumroll. Rook takes e7. <laughs> Rook takes e7. Sacrificing yet again. King takes e7 and queen to c5. Queen to c5. So it's a nice little... Um, a miniature that you can take a look at and try to solve yourself and after king to e8 i believe there is rook to e4 and my opponent played queen to e6 and truly after this it was still difficult to win because my queen was against two rooks but also at the end of the day these rooks are not connected and the moment they are connected it becomes a little bit more difficult to handle against a queen uh with a queen rather um but here yeah, I did not allow that and, and eventually I, I won the game. Okay, so let's go back to that moment over here. So this is what happens if they take the bishop, which I quite like because it gives white a lot more space in the center and leaves more room, ironically enough, for black to make mistakes. Yeah, so that is quite mind-blowing. You can always come back and, and look at this video and try to figure things out for yourself. It's just amazing what chess can offer, how many openings there are, and I can't wait to uh, stumble across more gambits and openings that um, inspire me to play more attacking chess, and I love to outsmart my opponent or to know a little bit more in theory. Uh, it's always cool, but like I said, use it as a secret weapon, um, use it uh, wisely, and uh, yeah, let's take a brief look at the fried liver attack before I call it a day. So the fried liver attack is something a little bit different. So you'll have d4 to your disposal, uh, but the fried liver attack is basically when you're not feeling too brave on a day, you can just play bishop c4. Your opponent will respond. Um, if they play bishop c5, the fried liver attack is not possible. They have to play knight to f6. And why is it not possible when they play bishop c5? Is because the whole point of the fried liver attack is you want to play knight to g5 to attack this pawn on f7, which is black's weakest pawn on the board until they castle. Then it becomes h7, I believe. Then if they play bishop to c5, you cannot play knight to g5. This would be a huge blunder, as you can see. This knight is free. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we've established that black has to play knight f6. Now you play knight to g5, attacking this beautiful f7 pawn. There are some lines that black can play in order to avoid the fried liver attack by playing d5, pawn takes, and knight a5. But we're not going to go into that. We're going to go into a situation where black doesn't know what to do in this position. Right. If they end up moving the bishop, you can simply take bishop takes f7 check and force black to lose castling rights. If they really don't do anything about it, you can simply play knight takes f7, forking the queen and the rook. But these are just basic instances. Let's say black plays d5. And you capture, and black thinks it's okay to capture back with the knight. Now you can pause the video and take a moment to think about what white will do. Right, white is going to play knight takes f7. Beautiful. And I love this attacking chess. It's brilliant. It oh, just gets the heart beating, you know? <laughs> okay, so king takes uh, is sort of forced because you are attacking 
uh, the queen and the rook. And now you're putting a pin, an absolute pin on this knight. So there's only one way to double attack. Queen to f3. You must have guessed it already. Queen to f3, check. The nice thing is, the more things your move does, the better it is. So multi-purpose moves are, you know, all the rage now with the kids and stuff. <laughs> but with chess, the more your move does, the better. All right, so queen is attacking d5, and there's only one way to defend uh, this knight. It's by playing king e6. And you may be thinking, it's not the end game yet. Why is the king in the center of the board? Is this king of the hill? Did I click on the wrong variant? Nope, this is all still theory. Okay, so if the king goes anywhere else, or maybe black plays queen f6 thinking, oh, you know, I've finally shielded my king, you can simply take and say, listen here, buddy, this is just not going well for you. And take the knight. Bless you. My dog just sneezed. Okay. So <laughs> bless you again. <laughs> so king to e6. And we are not going to capture the knight. We are going to pile the pressure. We're going to play knight to c3. Knight to c3. Yes, we are attacking the knight so many times. And there are a few things that black can do. Black can play knight to b4, which is not as favored. They usually play this move knight to e7. Funny enough, I've gotten into a lot of these positions. And um, now you can take a moment to think about the move. And the move is d4. d4. Yes. Alrighty. If they capture, well... Things just become a lot easier for us because I believe you have maybe something like queen e4 or bishop f4. Bishop f4 doesn't seem... Okay, maybe there's some science behind bishop f4. Uh, but I like I like this move, queen e4. Mm, let's see what the science is behind this. Although taking just seems like suicide in all honesty. And if they take the knight... Oh, very nice. You can long castle. This just gets crazier and crazier. I'm telling you right now. Wow. I bet if they take, you play king b1. You do play king b1. Okay, we're not going to go that deep into the line. We're just going to go over um, the normal moves here. Being after d4, black plays c6 to back up this knight even more. And now white plays bishop g5. Least active piece to most active square. We know that Paul Morphy would be proud knowing that we develop all our pieces and utilize them and uh, make sure they all work together in harmony. Oh, that sounds like a bumper sticker or poster quote. <laughs> okay, so bishop to g5, h6. And now we take it. And bishop takes. And finally, the move here is d takes e5. Just needed to double check. d takes e5. And it still looks like it's equal, but I definitely feel like white has more prospects in a position like this as opposed to what black has. Black might, might try to keep it uh, more safe because they would know exactly uh, if the theory is sound or if what they're doing is right. And that is when we catch them off guard because white will always have a chance to strike. If anyone is attacking, it's white in positions like this. And that is um, truly... How to have fun when playing Blitz and Bullet, trying to not play things like the London system where you're not guaranteed to have opening tactics and stuff like that. And um, honestly, I think my dog's an old man, but he's two years old and he pretends like he's 50 million years old. Okay, <laughs> but he's always, you know, a character and involved in all my stories. So there we go. Um, but I hope you guys learned a lot today. Thank you all for being here. I'm sorry I wasn't interacting with chat as much. But I hope that uh, when you stepped in here, you started having all the fun in the world. And that you will actually use these in your games coming up soon. Let me know in the comments if you did and what the results were like. I can't wait to see all of them. So thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to like the video. Subscribe if you're new here. And uh, definitely come back soon, trying to grow the YouTube channel. And this was a lot of fun. Thank you all. <laughs> I will see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>